Hello, hello everybody. Uh, continue to enjoy your lunch, but we're going to get started with our program. I'm Jody Schneider. I'm president of the FCC and senior international editor at Bloomberg. Uh, and I am very pleased to um, introduce our, our speaker, Jake Vandekamp, who will be in conversation uh, after he gives a talk with our um, correspondent member, board member, uh, Jennifer Hughes, who's of, of Reuters. Um, we're very pleased to not only have this event, but to be able to have in-person events. For a long time, we were not. We were just doing our Zoom events, but this is our second, and we're going to have some more coming up. I wanted to mention a few other uh, Zoom events we have coming up. Tomorrow, there'll be a panel uh, that Keith Richberg from our Board of Governors will moderate on how the Biden administration will manage its relationship with China. Among the um, panelists is Bonnie Glazer, who's a senior advisor for Asia and director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and who's very well uh, respected in this field. So that should be a really interesting and timely panel. And then on Monday, uh, I will be moderating a talk with uh, Mara Wissendahl, who's an investigative reporter on her book, The Scientist and the Spy. So if you're interested in a great spy story with a China angle, uh, please join us. That's another Zoom event this coming Monday. Uh, but now to the main event here today, uh, Jake, who many of you know, <laughs> I assume most of you in this room know Jake. Um, he's written a book called The Rise and Fall of the Hang Seng Index. Uh, and they are available if you haven't already bought yours. Um, and I bet you can even get him to sign it after. Um, and he's going to talk to us about his book. Um, he's arguing in the book that you are your own best invest investment advisor. Um, he cautions that you abdicate your intelligence when you turn investment decisions over to strangers. Uh, Jake came to Hong Kong in 1979 as a business reporter for the South China Morning Post. He made a 20-year career shift to investment banking and returned to the SCMP as a daily financial columnist. Two years ago, he retired to pursue a hobby of rewriting fairy tales for the modern context. And I think you might be, somebody might want to ask him about that. <laughs> uh, several of those he launched here at the FCC. He was our treasurer here for five years uh, on the Board of Governors of the FCC. So um, we will have a chance to ask some questions. When you do ask questions, we ask that you um, wear your mask. We are, of course, trying to uh, be as uh, safe and careful here at, and at this time of pandemic as we can. I give you Jake Vanderkam. And to think that even after 20 years at the South China Morning Post, it's the Foreign Correspondence Club that muzzles me. Fellow club members, guests, back in ancient history, somewhere about the time of Julius Caesar, I think it was, I took a job as an investment analyst with Sun and Case Securities in its glory days. Uh, glory days because the business of stockbroking for big accounts at that time in Hong Kong was entirely dominated by three or four British firms, Vickers da Costa, Jardine Fleming, Horgovet, and so on. And even the, uh, the Americans were not yet on the horizon back then. And right through them came this local firm, Sun and K Securities, right into the front ranks. Business boomed. And we opened an office in London, and it was so successful that in year two, the head of office called the chairman one day and said, uh, Mr. Fung, I think the place to be is not London, it's Switzerland. So. Uh, Mr. Fung said, well, if you say so, all right. We moved to Switzerland, or that office moved to Switzerland on December 31st. And just under a year later, the head of office called again and said, Mr. Fung, maybe I made a mistake. Perhaps we should go back to London. And 367 days after leaving London, the office was back in London. And in the process, our head of office saved himself a reported half a million sterling from the UK taxman. And that was in the days of Julius Caesar, a tidy sum. Anyway, one day at work, I received a telex from this man. Uh, uh, no internet those days, and no fax even. And it said, of this list of the top 100 companies in Hong Kong, mark A, B, or C. A, perfect, no problem. B, hmm, 
see serious problems. So, uh, so I canvassed my colleagues, marked out that list A, B, and C, six names are on the C list, and sent it back before noon to the London office, where the desk then got busy with the client base and you know, called them up and said, look, uh, our research uh, division in Hong Kong has been doing a month-long exercise of drilling deep into the accounts of all the biggest companies here and looking at the financial prospects. Uh, it was a worthwhile time to do it because the markets were a big tight with the Volcker tightening uh, that had just come to its peak and generally headed down for a while. In any case, <coughs> the clients got this list of companies marked A, B, and C and they said to our desk, mm, that's very interesting. And then they put down the phone and went deep, 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 picked the phone up again and called Jardine Fleming, Vickers da Costa, Hargovit, our competitors, and said, did you know that Sun and K Security says, Carrion Investments, Exxon, Iowa, and a few others are going bust? Oh, said our competitors, how interesting and put the phone down and picked it up again, deet, 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 and phoned Carrion Investments, Exxon, Yiwon, Goodyear Estates, and said, did you know that Sun and Security says you're going bust? <laughs> and I came into the office the next day, hanging onto my job by my fingernails, <laughs> called in to the, by the chairman's uh, personal assistant, T.L. Jim, and said, that was very stupid. You should have known better than to play with fire. Now you will apologize, write a letter of apology to all of those six companies and don't do that again. I just went, whew, still have the job. Walked to the desk, wrote six um, <clears throat> um, excrement ingesting letters <laughs> and, uh, and everything was fine. And all of those six companies shortly went bust for which I claim no great insight because everyone knew they would go bust. What everyone also knew, everyone that is except one numbskulled individual, is that if you wanted to tell the client so, you went, <laughs> pull out a cell slip and wrote a cell order. You didn't blare it out through a megaphone. Well, I'd learned my lesson. From then on, no more of this buy, hold, sell recommendations of brokers. My three recommendations became buy, buy on weakness, and long-term buy. <laughs> and I heard a few other good euphemisms for sell over the time. <laughs> My favorites, uh, source of funds, <laughs> and disaccumulate. <laughs> Yes, well, those are the glory days out there, and the rich and famous of Hong Kong all send uh, their children out to us uh, uh, for jobs, and the chairman couldn't refuse. They were his friends, they were good clients, they were potential good clients, and nor had he any place to put them. Couldn't put them in the back office, though that would have been the best place to learn the trade. Couldn't put them in the uh, dealing room. If they didn't know what they were doing, they'd contrive to lose money. So we got them in research. And fellow would arrive on a Monday morning, and our head of sales and research, Frank Heath, would come up and say, congratulations, you've arrived at the engine room of the finance industry in Hong Kong. You've got a wonderful career going ahead of you. Congratulations. But look, before we start anything over here, maybe it's best that you brief yourself a little. So just stay there. And then he'd walk to the library, the Clippings Library, and he'd turn to the librarian and say, uh, Shirley, uh, let's have STU this today. And Shirley would pull out a, a number of files of, at random of companies whose names begin with the letters S, T, and U, pick them up on a pile, and Frank would pick them up, walk to the desk. There, start with these. <laughs> well, um, they mostly left before Friday, of course. And uh, he had other tests then for uh, how we would uh, bring them on if we were to keep them with, uh, these people with us. For the women who were there, it was mostly the regular coven on the dealing room he left the judgment to. For the men, eh, he had a different test. 
He'd come by and say, look, the lads and I are going out for a drink at end of week this evening. Uh, can I join us? And uh, oh, it's a summons. Of course, the fellow would. So we'd go off to the Bull and Bear and Hutchinson House or the, you know, the Jockey Club Bar in Swire House, which we used to call the ashtray because it only had one single ventilating fan. And Frank would proceed to pour four quick pints of beer down the candidate's throat. Now, drink up, you in a second. And if after four, he was still standing, and he was a candidate. Because what Frank was looking for was not research analysts. What he wanted was people who were sociable, worldwide, had good connections, who he could put in research for a few months and then bring out into the dealing disc where they could make real money for the company. Analysts? Well, you know those pictures you've seen, I'm sure, of the uh, Houston Space Center, row upon row of consoles, and behind them, all these fellows in short sleeve, white shirts, button to the throat, plastic shirt protector with six pens clipped to it, that sort of thing. Hmm? Analysts. And you couldn't let these people loose on the clients because they would just start talking rocket science about comparative cash flow ratios and just leave the clients dazed. And the worst thing, most difficult thing about them was these analysts didn't understand share price. They could work out exactly where the earnings might be going given this, given that, and so on. But is it worth the current share price? They couldn't say. And if they went to Frank and said, well, I really like IGB, and he'd say, what? You told us six months ago to sell that stock at $10, and now you're telling us to buy it at 15? What am I going to tell the people I took out of it? A year recommendation. And off they would go and analyze some more. And if you did really ask them, they would tell you maybe, yeah, buy on weakness. <laughs> they, they weren't going to be, they didn't do share price, they were analysts. Now, I can make that also a case for uh, several other people you'll read in the investment business. Your investment advisor, for instance, who, let's say you're a, a home renovations expert, and you'll say to yourself, look, if that investment advisor wants to remodel his kitchen, he comes to me. And me, I don't know anything about investment. If I want someone to help me invest my money, I go to him. Seems to make sense, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Because there's one big question that you have to ask. And that is, why is this fellow sitting in front of me in a small, rinky little office in his bank building <coughs> uh, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny Friday afternoon when He'd rather be out on a big white plastic palace boat in Double Haven with his lady and his friends and cold beer in the cooler and someone cooking dinner down below. What's he still doing here if he really knows what's going up and what's going down on the market? And why hasn't he long ago done it himself and been out there on that boat? Huh? If he's so smart, why ain't he rich? And people don't ask that question, but it is the most important question to ask because it will tell you that he doesn't know or he wouldn't be there. What he knows is how to buy your investments and where to buy them. He knows no better than anyone else what to buy or when. Take that to another class of uh, expert you might see from time to time. You pick up the Financial Times and you read that IGA Corp has just failed at stage three trials of its new wonder drug, and you know the share price is going down. You know that, don't you? Hmm? You'd be wrong. You're talking the future tense. You need the past tense. It's gone down. By the time you see it there in the Financial Times, it's done on the market. And here's the rule for that. It's in the price if it's in the press. You're not going to make yourself rich on your investments by reading the Financial Times. That's just the way it is. You read it because it's a thrilling, gripping newspaper, a 
sort of. Um, so where do I break all this down? Well, you know those big glass jars you sometimes see full of small little jelly beans and a little plaque that says, save the children fund $10, guess the number of, je of jelly beans in this jar, winner gets a free night and free dinner at the peninsula. Hmm? And people start putting their guesses in. And after a while, you can start drawing a chart of where those guesses go. It'd be, you know, number of jelly beans along the bottom line, and the top line is the number of people who guess whatever price. And as you start getting those guesses coming in into the hundreds, you begin to see a pattern on the chart. And if it goes up into the thousands, that pattern will be very clear. It's a bell curve. And, uh, and the peak of that bell curve will coincide with the correct answer to the puzzle. Happens all the time on that kind of a contest. And what it's telling you is that what the individual doesn't know, the overall community does. And that's the way it is in the market. Uh, because what you're looking at in any share price that you're looking at, any investment price, is not, uh, is actually hundreds of millions of people making that bet, even if they're saying, we don't want it. Okay? They're making an estimate of what they're going to be doing. And you yourselves are making an estimate, though you don't know it. It's in the pension funds that you hold, or the mutual funds, or even in the bank deposits you make, and what the bank will do with that to this particular stock, what price they may advance the money and what not. That share price represents the collected wisdom of the market on that stock at that time, for over a hundred million people, and no individual is going to do better than that. It doesn't say that it's always right. It's not psychic. It represents all that is known, weighted for how much money people do want to put into that. So you might say, well, that's rather <coughs> dull, because what prospect does it give me if really we've already got all this in the price as it stands, making any money from investment. But there's another way of looking at it, which is to say, it's all thoroughly pre-researched for you. Your odds at any given time for what is known to the market is 50-50. Now, those odds might change, those figures, not numbers might change as, the, uh, as new information comes in and the share price will move in response and you're still at roughly 50-50 balance of opinion. Doesn't say it never moves. We know what an average sea level may be to a millimeter. That doesn't stop waves from going up and down. Okay? And you might have a little bit of input to make as uh, based on good judgment, which is something you learn at your mother's knee. You don't get from a, from a business school prof and nor from the Financial Times. But on balance, you're getting a pre-researched price for that investment and it's pretty good at figuring out what that security is actually worth. Huh? So what I'm saying here is, look, go to the investment advisor, go to any other, go to your broker to execute your trades for you, to tell you, to, to manage the how and where of it. But the what and when is your decision. All these experts in the trade know that no more than you do that their expertise is technical. Hmm? The investment advisor expertise is somewhere along the line of the bank tellers, really. Uh, and make that choice yourself. And you abdicate your own intelligence if you turn that choice over to a stranger. And so that's the book that I've written, Rise and Fall of the Hang Seng Index. Uh, all kinds of worthwhile observations for you <laughs> on the markets, and I'll give you three good reasons to buy it right now. The first is that I've strong-armed my publisher into offering you here today a 25% discount off the list price. Right? You're getting it at a bargain. Second, Christmas is coming up. This is going to be an excellent Christmas present. Put it under the tree for people. Huh? Third, if you don't buy it, boom, 
I'm going to shoot my dog. And you don't want to be held responsible for that, do you? Thank you. It's safe to say that you're, you're, you are your own best salesman. <laughs> but in recommending the book, I would say that, sorry, I'm Jennifer Hughes. I'm, um, I work for Reuters Breaking Views, which is the commentary, mostly financial, mostly financial commentary unit from Reuters. And I've been a financial journalist for 20 years. 18 of them were at the Financial Times, which I promise you is a really great publication, <laughs> despite, you know. <laughs> from a talk like that um, I don't know quite where to start with questions I'm going to pop one in there while other people are thinking of theirs but there will be microphones going around so raise your hand with the lights on I can't see everybody so you're going to have to wave at me a bit to get the questions in um, Jake in the back of the book you talk about sort of some of the most important lessons beyond you are your own best advisor what's next What's the most important thing? Um, it's in the price if it's in the press, uh, about anything that you see in the papers. Uh, to give you a few others, uh, for every adjective you add to the instrument, you add 1% or 2% to the fee. A good reason to stick away from derivatives. <laughs> uh, keep it simple. Uh, don't deal too often. If you're worried about people who are working off inside information uh, or manipulating the market, they can't touch you if you don't deal too often. Unless you've got a very good reason to sell or buy something anew, keep what you've got. Another one, um, the exits, no matter how wide in the market, are never wide enough for a stampede. Once there's a real scare out, you won't get through that exit, no matter what. So you might as well just sit tight with what you've got. Um, remind me of a few more I put in there, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good summary of the top ones there. Uh, questions. Lucy, over in the corner. Have you got a microphone and a mask on? I'm not even allowed to touch the microphone. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's quite a lot about what not to do. What should we be doing? Like, what are your recommendations for things that, that if it's all in the price, I mean, I know you didn't say that it doesn't change, but what are the things we should be looking for? Uh, now, one of the big problems we've got today, in particular, is that investment analysis traditionally is based on the earnings or the income flow from the investment you make. It's a capital value of it is a multiple of what that income is. And that's the basic standard for any investments whatsoever, right? Traditionally. Now, <coughs> what we've got at the moment, however, is a pricing of investments that has gone thoroughly awry. They used to say that the definition of political stability is money at 6%, and that gives you, you know, a place that is going to be very strong, currency, sound economy, and you get that down. But at the moment, with a U.S. 10-year treasury at a fraction of 1%, <laughs> that's all out of the window. And what's happened here is that the central banks of the world have taken this idea that, yeah, well, if we get political and economic stability, we get 6%. What about if we take interest rates to 6%? Will we get economic and political stability? Does it work in reverse? And the answer coming in so far is, no, it does not. What you get is a mainstream economy hollowed out of its manufacturing, clearly happening in the United States right now, an enormous speculative bubble in financial markets with complete polarization of wealth and income. And that's the state we're in at the moment. We're looking at speculative markets, and right now, most of any investment you make is based on a guess of how long will Jerome Powell at the Fed, and how long will the ECB keep this rolling? And that doesn't make for a healthy market at any time. But, you know, how would you know what's a good price to, set, to take and what investment you should make? I come back to this one set, basics that it's a matter of good judgment, and good judgment is a matter of character. And in every single time, it'll be a different question you ask about any given investment. There is no hard and fast rule that way. 
but good judgment is not learned from the economics professor or from the newspapers. You've got it early in life, and that can help you a bit. It'll keep you clear of the worst rows in the market. It will alert you occasionally to, oh, I don't, don't quite believe that. But that's as far as I would go. Another question right next to you. I'll, I'll hold your mic. Hi, yeah, my name is Suhas. I'm a, formerly a financial journalist. I'm still really getting to grips with the history of the Hang Seng Index and Hong Kong financial markets. So if you just go back to the title of the book, right? The rise and fall of the Hang Seng Index. What do you feel about like the turning points in the uh, no, uh, past two decades that led to the rise? And what was like a fall that was memorable? Well, the rise, quite simply, is that China rose. And all that financial activity went through Hong Kong right through the 80s and 90s and created a stellar rise in the market. And it really was an enormous rise. Hong Kong did very well in that. What do I remember? Oh, the crashes. You know, when this market crashes, it goes down 70%. Bounces back again, but does go down 70% or so. And I can remember the one in 1981. Oh, we didn't get any bonuses back then, <laughs> not for years to come. In fact, um, you know, I, I moved to, lived in Chung Chow for five years just to keep the rent down. Uh, that was the worst of the market there. Uh, the 87 crashed in the United States, it just translated right over here. The market shut down for four days. That huge one from the top in uh, 1998, 70, 80% down. Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> Clients don't like you. <laughs> no bonuses. You're holding on to your job. Not fun. Not fun. But on the way up, it was. What about just on that? What about the market since uh, since the financial crisis since 2008? It's been pretty much up and up and up. Yeah. Um, the uh, in, at the height in 2007, 2008, this market was trading at about 32,000 on the index. It's at 26 now, uh, 13 years later. There's not been that much happening here over that time. And frankly, I don't think it's going to be, we're going to see again the kind of big lift that we saw in the 80s and 90s. It, uh, this market has really done its thing in a big way already. And the, you know, p the political matters, the political affairs, do have a depressing effect. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's all encompassing yet, but it is definitely there. Um, and I don't see the same kind of government as the regulation we're seeing here. So no, um, don't see a big prospect here. My, I myself think that looking around the region generally, that you're more likely to see a, a big move upwards in uh, Southeast Asia in places like uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, that whole area, uh, and maybe in Korea, not in Japan. And my own view on China is that um, there's trouble coming. Uh, there's uh, this being too much interference in, in financial affairs at the level of the government. But I don't see a crash. I see the big danger of being something like Japan did, fall asleep for 20 years and everyone forgets you for a while. Um, and particularly with aging population and, and all kinds of financial, hidden financial problems that they're facing. I still think that that's sitting there. Uh, so really, I would concentrate more on the southern side, Southeast Asia side. I think most of us will find it hard to forget China, but good point. Uh, another question, one over in the corner here. Oh, sorry, I should say, please do identify yourself. Uh, Bob Meyer with, uh, I'm in PharmaLink International. Hi, Jake. Um, question, with all the money printing going on, quantitative easing, not just in the United States, but uh, everywhere, what is your view on gold? Yeah. Well, let's make it clear. Quantitative easing does not, is not equivalent to printing money. Essentially, it's with the central bank buying government debt up and crediting the, uh, the banks from which it buys it with reserves at the central bank. So uh, what it does is by buying at ever higher prices, depresses interest rates. And that's the, that's the intention of quantitative easing, to depress interest rates without actually printing a great deal of money. Uh, and uh, what's my view on gold? I'm not a gold bug. Uh, gold in its time 
was valued because it's lustrous, it's malleable, uh, and it's easily worked. Um, those are not features that make things for gold at all any longer. But most of all, gold for hundreds, thousands of years worked because the amount of gold in the system times its volatility was equal to the amount of GDP, which means that gold held a very constant value. And I don't think that can be the case any longer. And certainly since we've gone off the gold standard, it is not the case. Um, I regret it in some ways gold standard was a superb way of enforcing real responsibility on central banks. Uh, but I, I, I don't think it's coming back. And yeah, well, it doesn't pay you any dividends. It costs you money to store, all of those things. I would think there's no such thing as a precious metal any longer. They're all base metals now. They're, they're useful, they're, they're priced for their uses. We're not there there yet. You know, gold has had a long history in the mentality of the human race. And that's not going to vanish very quickly, but that, I think, is the long-term trend. Uh, another question at the back there. I'm To Han Shi, a former reporter at the South China Morning Post. Uh, two questions. One is the Wall Street Journal re reported that it was Xi Jinping who canned the end IPO. What kind of bad omens do you portend for Hong Kong's capital market from this action? My second question is, uh, do you think sometime in future the Chinese leaders will kind of sideline or get rid of the traditional Hong Kong tycoons like Li ka and replace in Hong Kong uh, mainland Chinese tycoons who are friendly to the Chinese leaders. Good afternoon, Hunchy. I hadn't seen you sitting around the corner there. <laughs> uh, on that first question, um, we've seen the eruptions already with, uh, with Ant Financial with a sudden stopping of the, of, of the listing there, and it was a political uh, move uh, very clearly in response to comments that Jack May had made about the government of China. It doesn't bode well for any market for uh, government officials to come in quite that strongly. Uh, and yeah, I think that does have a bad effect, but a lot of it, that effect has been taken into account already. You know, markets forget some things after a while and keep on moving on from there. Uh, and would uh, people in China like to replace uh, the Hong Kong tycoons? No, I think they want to be their own tycoons and their own place of business, their own place of location. And the tycoons we speak of were the tycoons of the 80s and 90s. They're getting on. They're getting on. And that's not really the style of what Hong Kong business is anymore. Just um, um, Li ka Shings and, and, uh, and Teng Yu Tongs and, uh, uh, and Sei Sooks and so on. That is the 1980s rise, not the 2020s. But a lot of those guys, their companies are still around and still dominating the market. They're still a very present force, or their sons are now present force. True. Um, but there's always this trend in, in this particular society of um, the first generation makes it, the second generation enjoys it, and the third generation wastes it. <laughs> Seen it over and over and over again. <laughs> in fact, it's, I think, a natural trend of, of, of capitalist societies to see this happen. And <laughs> I suspect it will happen in this one as well. Uh, another question? There's one just here. Hi, my name is Fred. I work at uh, American Bank, the one that you mentioned that wasn't really in the horizon when you first started. Uh, I just have a question and bring it back to, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, things like uh, if it's in the press, it's already in the price, you know, with the advent of these passive investments, like, you know, you can have by S&P or Russell 2000 or these type of index funds. So what's the point? If, do you see any value uh, for the sell side, for any of these research on individual companies, if you know, if I put my money in S and P, I would have doing nothing. I would have been up ten percent already this year. What's your view on that? Um, I think on the sell side, in terms of uh, recommendations, it makes the, the traditional investment research is far less important or significant today than it was twenty, thirty years ago when every broker would stock his, uh, his office with 10 or 20 research analysts, people are beginning to understand that largely, these folk don't know it, that there are many more sources of information immediately available, which there clearly are with the communications revolution. 
um, and that there are many instruments more in which you can spread your risk out. So what I think we're talking about really is the demise of investment research to a much less important status than before. Yeah. If that answers the question in part. Uh, another question? All right, while well, someone's thinking of one, I've got one in the meantime. I mean, we keep saying, if it's in the press, it's in the price, which is a very nice line. Um, we're in the Foreign Correspondence Club. Uh, <laughs> give me a reason here to be reading the financial press. Give me justification for my job, in other words. Yeah, I knew I was going to get my membership of this club revoked for that remark. <laughs> <laughs> I personally find um, investment news and finance fascinating. Uh, and just in terms of how uh, economies are coming together, where the resources are, uh, and uh, that to me draws an interest in the financial press immediately. Um, I don't read it for tips. I don't rely on it for tips. I would never recommend it for tips. But if you're involved in finance yourself, it's, you know, it, it's, yeah, it can be very interesting stuff to read. And that, to me, is where the real interest comes through. An understanding of, of, uh, of financial affairs. Anyway. I think I can hold my job for another day. <laughs> With me on the other side, you're in no danger. <laughs> Andrew Kinlock of Logie Group. To what extent does the index reflect the broader market? After all, I think there are only 33 constituents in the index. Swaz have just dropped out of it and been replaced by an online shopping app. And once a, a stock enters the index, a lot of passive funds have to go out and buy it, which presumably drives the price up. Yeah. Uh, this is the Hang Seng Index, which <coughs> sorry, sorry. traditionally... I think there's 50 stocks as well. Sorry, it's not oh, 50, 50 no. 30. Yeah, it traditionally hasn't been the best constructed index. Uh, I think it is somewhat representative of this market, but the big difficulty is that we've gone here in, tw in about 20, 25 years uh, from near zero China participation. I mean, I was at Horgavet when we brought out China Southern Glass, a B share, back in, was it 92? Or, or, you know, and, and that was the first China stock listed on this market. Hmm? That was all there was. We now have something like 70% of the market cap representing China. So what do we have in this industry? What are we representing? Uh, China, because this is a convenient listing post. Hong Kong, um, hard to say, but certainly it represents China very strongly at the moment. Yeah? More so than you would really think uh, a market that is still supposedly has its own legal system and currency, its own autonomy, should be representing China. So I wouldn't place too much emphasis on, on the Hang Seng. Index. In fact, you know, most big investment managers don't look at indexes like the Hang Seng at all. They're all looking at the Morgan Stanley Capital International FT indices, which cover all markets on an uh, equivalent basis and which separate out by free float, uh, you know, uh, uh, dividends included and dividends not, all those sorts of things. I mean, for instance, the Hang Seng Index, traditionally its members paid a dividend this is going back 20 years or so, a dividend yield of about 4% a year. You didn't see that in the performance of the index because as soon as the dividend is out, the price drops by the extent of the dividend. Right? And the index does not account for that. So then in fact, you're doing far better than the index represents. Uh, and you see that occasionally in these things called total return indices that assume that you, you put all your money right back into it again. Far, far better. So again, the professional index makers, Capital International and the FT, will give you indices that reflect just that. Uh, and that's what the professionals look at only. Uh, we have another question here. Hi, my name is Alok Jain. Uh, what is your view on these tech valuations? You see companies coming out with their prospectuses, which says they're never going to make money, and yet people line up, they fall over each other, so things are oversubscribed by four, five, you know, 400, 500 times. How does that work? What, what is your view on that? 
called the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. For the long run, it's going to come out. This is very largely the result of bringing interest rates down to fractions of 1% and encouraging this multiple creep, this huge speculation on, on, on stock markets. Uh, you then get a lot of people moving into tech stocks because they look good. My own rule is the more boring, the better. Uh, you know, get, the, get the appeal out of these things. Now, I wouldn't hold a good number of these tech stocks. I really wouldn't. That's not to say, you know, a blanket, TSMC in, in, in Taiwan is one of the soundest performers of any market. But these new things, traveling at 400 times earnings, the new economy ones, where the backers don't even have to hold any stock, they can control full voting rights and not holding any stock, oh, that's looking for a disaster at some time. It surely is. And we've seen this before at various times. You had the thing called the growth enterprise market in Hong Kong starting up in 98. You want to see a woeful track. <laughs> Look at the performance of the gem market over that time. A disaster. A real disaster. So, you know, I stay clear. But TSMC and a few like that are always good. Uh, another question? Uh, yep, question over here. Hi, I'm Gabriel Tan. Um, so I, my question is, I really like that soundbite, right? If it's in the news, it's in the price. But if you think about it, this has very low utility because if you examine it deeper, especially as a trading strategy, be because if it's true, you can literally short most stocks when major positive news comes out. And we know that that's not true because I don't think that this has been a viable trading strategy for most people. So, you know, what's, what's your take on that? So how do, how do we get more value and utility out, out of this soundbite? If you're close to the events any time, you pick up the flash of the first time on some major sad news, and you've got a, a, an account where you can put in an instant short, uh, you might be there. Hmm? Uh, but you have to be very fast, certainly not by the time you read it in a newspaper. It's got to be really quick and flash. And what also happens that very often, though, is that the price drops really quickly, goes too far. People still bounce, bounces back again. I, I think the markets pretty much take care of that themselves. The other thing with the shorts is, well, you've got to pay for a short. You've got to borrow the stock. You've got to borrow just to be able to hold the right to, call to short the stock. Hmm? Uh, so being short always... It's one of these great lines that uh, Peter Lynch, the big guru of the Fidelity Magellan Fund, came up one day. He said uh, that he likes ordinary shares because with ordinary shares, your downside is limited, your upside is infinite. Whereas with derivatives, your downside is infinite and your upside is limited. And there's some truth to that. <laughs> but I'm of the view that if anything in the market makes anyone certain money, the price will move pretty quickly, so you're back at 50-50 odds. And I think that's generally the, 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 the experience of most people who rely on the short side of the market. Uh, one last question. Um, I can see. Okay. Lucy, go for it. Hi, Lucy. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm a freelance journalist who used to be at the FT, very august paper. <laughs> Highly recommend reading it, notwithstanding Jake's comments. Um, I was going to ask whether you thought, you mentioned earlier that the death of the research analyst, with which I completely agree after my many years in finance as well. Um, do you think that's partly due to changes in insider information rules as well? Because obviously previously your analysts potentially had a little bit of an insight into stuff and you know you could you could give people the nod perhaps which now is no longer possible. Um, yeah, inside information to me is, is, is it sounds so attractive to a lot of people. First of all, 90% of what's uh, uh, what's spoken on a dealing desk in any in any uh, brokerage operation purports to really to be inside information. Hmm? Listen, I, you know, I've been told, keep this quiet, but, <laughs> and it's nonsense. 99% of what purports to be inside information is not. Uh, so I would be sticking quite clear of that. Um, where it does apply these days, we have ever fancier software programs in the Securities Commission that are picking up the trading patterns very quickly. 
and catching people short with this with, uh, with it. But Percy, it doesn't. I, mean, I don't really object to seeing it that much. I don't think it's a huge uh, impact on the market. I think most of it's pretty small time stuff. Um, and uh, yes, in the past, there was. You know, Oh, they talk some grand inside information scandals over here. Uh, and what has happened here sometimes is, is that um, the people involved, they've been strong, have got off completely. I cite the case of Siddick and the accumulators that they got out of. Hmm? Won't name exact names there, but some people managed to escape insider dealing time in jail by getting out of town in time and they're not back here again, thank heavens. Uh, and this has happened in the past as well. Lee ka is a convicted insider dealer, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that was a grand story, but I haven't got time for it. But he is. <laughs> I don't think it's a big effect. Okay. Well, with that, to give everyone time who hasn't already bought Jake's book to do so and to obviously save his dog, um, I'll wrap up now. And it just leaves me to say, Jake, thank you very much for a highly entertaining talk. And I fully recommend the book to people. It's it's very useful to go back to the basics and just remember it's not rocket science. So, Jake, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kate Spurrier is there with the books. I'll stay here and sign it for anyone who wants to come up and have a signed copy. Do save my dog. Do help your friends with Christmas presents. <laughs>